today uh, we have Gary Moglioni, who is the portfolio manager uh, for the Momentum Multi-Asset Value Trust. Uh, and Gary will be doing the bulk of the presentation, but he's ably abetted by Lucy Dolan, who is the senior business development consultant and works closely with Gary on the team. So I'm going to hand over to Gary and Lucy now. So welcome to both of you. And I will pick up at the end with the Q&A. Hi, good evening, everybody. Um, thanks for the introduction, Mike. Um, as Mike explained, my name is Lucy. I am Business Development Manager for the Momentum Multi-Asset Value Trust. And today I'm joined by my colleague and the Trust Lead Portfolio Manager, Gary Moglioni. Um, I'm just going to pull up our slides, which you will be able to see um, just shortly. So hopefully everybody can see that now. Um, so today, if I just call up the agenda for today's presentation and um, to give you all a couple of moments to glance over. But essentially today, over the next 40 minutes or so, we just really like to, you to get to know us as the trust manager. We're going to be sharing insight on essentially how we see the world and our approach to refining value. And Gary will expand on that shortly. Um, but ultimately, how that enables us as managers to um, extend your opportunity set and support you with not only high growth and long term sustainable income, but perhaps more importantly, um, the last 18 months has highlighted the need for diversification. And that's something that we feel our differentiated approach can really support with. Um, so before I hand over to Gary to get into the nitty gritty of the presentation, um, I just want to make two statements that if you can, I'd really like you to keep in the back of your mind as this presentation unfolds. The fact is that we are different. So we're high conviction investors. We're really passionate about what we do. And that means that we don't believe in following heads. We don't believe in hugging benchmarks. You know, if we think an investment opportunity is going to be good for our investors, then we won't shy away from being different. The second is the fact that we're a boutique. So whilst we are part of a much larger global organization, when it comes to managing money in the UK, we're very much at the smaller end of the spectrum. And um, you may be wondering, why is that so important? Why do you reference that? Well, actually that's pivotal to the way in which we manage our clients' money. The fact that we're smaller means we can be a bit more dynamic, we be a bit more niche, and it means we can invest differently to many of our peers in the multi-asset space. Um, I won't steal Gary's thunder, so I'll hand over to him in a second. But as I say, we can keep that in your back of your mind as the presentation unfolds. There are several examples that Gary's going to talk you through where our smaller size is pivotal to us in being able to access, access those opportunities. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, okay, so if I just give a brief run through for the team. Uh, the majority of the team will work together for over 10 years. I, I'm, the, I'm the newest member. I joined in 2018. I was working over in Dublin for Amundi, who are the, the largest uh, asset manager in Europe at the moment. Uh, on a multi-asset team that we manage 200 billion. And the background from a lot of the team is from pension funds, wealth managers, uh, consultants. So we've all worked for those big businesses with huge AUMs. And, and what we want to do is, is to apply our own process, high conviction process. Uh, and we've come together on apply our valuation based process as well. So we've come together, we work well together. The team is, is four PMs and then five, or five PMs, sorry, I'm supported by two uh, analysts as well. Uh, it's very much a team approach to the decision making. Everyone has their own research responsibilities, but the ultimate decisions and what gets into the portfolio is very much a team process. And any new ideas need to be brought to the table, checked over, validated, and, and challenged by the team before it gets into the portfolio. And just, just a brief uh, kind of description of, of, of what our philosophy is. So we are value managers and value managers are normally in the value kind of mindset is normally wedded to the equity market. But what we're doing is we're applying that strict valuation mindset across numerous asset classes. So if you think about a basic, uh, you know, an old style balanced fund which invests just in, in, in equities and bonds, we've broadened that asset class even further. So we have what we call specialist assets. So in addition to global equities, in addition to bonds, we have specialist assets, which the subsectors that would be private equity, would be property, would be infrastructure, and would be what we call specialist financials, which are investments that are bond-like, that generate a, a strong uh, dividend yield, but also have the potential for capital growth as well. So examples would be loans, mortgages, those type of, type of investments. 
Uh, let's give a, a brief kind of you know, what does what does this trust set out to achieve? Uh, we're not looking to we're looking to do CPI plus six per annum, but we can't do that on a calendar year. So we're looking at it over a cycle. Now, how do we define a cycle? We're looking maybe five to ten years. So the total return with what we're trying to achieve is CPI plus six after costs with low volatility relative to the to the global equity market. We also pay a dividend, so that objective is split roughly 50-50 between capital growth and income. On that income, we don't want it to be eroded over time by, by inflation, and that's you know, very important in the, in the environment that we're in now as well. So what we aim to do is also increase the dividend over time, at least in line with inflation. The current yield of the, the trust is just over 3.5%, and the dividend is paid quarterly, March, June, September, December. So the next ex-dividend date would be I think, towards the end of November. The AIC sector that we sit in is the flexible investments, uh, which is you know, quite a, a unique sector within the AIC with lots of different types of, of, of trusts. Okay, so where are we now and kind of how, how, what, what would you expect this, this trust to be structured? So again, our objective is, 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 is income and growth. Uh, our allocation is across numerous uh, buckets that we see, such as UK equity, overseas equity, credit, specialist assets, defensive assets and cash. Now we have an SAA, so that's the, what, what allocation we think will achieve the objectives. That's, that should remain fairly static. And then because we want to add value over time, we then have an assets allocation so we can go above or below that strategic assets allocation. So where would you typically see this fund position? So the SAA is 35% UK equity. So there's a strong tilt in the equity allocation towards the home market, the UK. 25% uh, overseas equity. 15% credit, 25% specialist assets. Now, where does that leave us at the moment? So the current allocations are on the screen there. So we're slightly underweight equity. Obviously, markets have, have, have recovered quite well. Uh, they're trading quite rich at the moment. But we are actually still quite bullish on the equity market. But we've had a couple of stocks that have been bid for in recent weeks. So our equity allocation has come down as we've trimmed those positions and, and, and exited the stocks. Credit, we're obviously at, at, at quite a, a low exposure given where valuations are in, in, in credit markets. Um, where our big overweight is at the moment is in specialist assets. And that's partially because of their durability during the COVID crisis. So the, and particularly on the income side as well, which I'll go into a bit more detail later on. We also have just under the 3% allocation to defensive assets. So there are a number of tools that we, we intend to use when we think markets are overvalued to, to put some protection into the, into the portfolio. Right now, we just have two investments in there. We have physical gold. And um, we have a gold mining fund as well. So it's gold exposure in the defensive assets and a little bit of cash just for the day-to-day the -day management of, of the fund. So these are the different buckets that we invest in. So this is how we, we kind of split the portfolio and different people on the team have research responsibilities for these essentially different portfolios within the, within the, within the trust. So let's talk through each one of them. First, UK equities. This will not be a, 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 an average UK equity portfolio. It's quite concentrated, it'll be 15 to 25 stocks. It's currently around 23. It will have a mid cap focus. So a lot of uh, kind of UK equity funds that generate income will have a you know, FTSE 100 bias and a large cap focus to generate the yield. We have very much a mid cap value focus. Uh, I think we currently have two, maybe three FTSE 100 stocks in the portfolio. So how the UK equity portfolio generates its returns and its income will be very different from a, a traditional UK equity income fund. Now the UK equity we manage in-house, that's our home market. So we think we know the market well, we can add value and that's why we manage it in-house. But we can't say that we're experts on every single asset class in every region around the world. So we, we operate a hybrid model where our home market we invest directly and then the other markets which is overseas credit specialist assets and defensives. We allocate to the best of breed managers. So we have a number of, of fund selection staff that are constantly out there trying to find the best managers and what it also allows us to do is to be nimble and to move. So a part of the cycle, different managers will, 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 will face headwinds and tailwinds. So it allows us to move between managers as well, rather than have one in-house manager with one philosophy being applied right the way through the, the cycle. So overseas equities, what are we looking for? We like boutique managers. We like uh, benchmark agnostic managers. Nothing should be in the portfolio unless it's a high conviction idea. Uh, high active share. So we want managers that are ignoring the benchmark, again, and only picking high conviction ideas. And niche managers, so usually the regional managers, they'll specialize in maybe uh, mid caps or maybe a, a, a smaller market and they'll have a strong research focus in one particular market. Credit's the same, so we're looking for third party managers, we're looking for, for a decent yield, 
we're looking for managers that can that can uh, that can avoid defaults. But most interesting asset class, which clients seem to find them, you know, talk about the most, is specialist assets, and that is our investments in trusts. It's private equity, property, specialist financials, uh, and infrastructure. It's it's a very diverse asset class. It's currently the highest yielding part of the portfolio. The sustainability of that income has been very strong, particularly through COVID, which has been one of the greatest tests to durability of income that we've probably seen in the past 100 years. Uh, it's exposure to real assets. The closed-ended structure of the specialist assets, the investment trust, allows us to access these more liquid investments. Uh, it allows us to harvest that liquidity premium, and it allows us to provide more diversification because we have loans in there, we have uh, we have property funds, we have music royalties, we have a number of different uh, performance drivers in there. So that the, the diversification of returns and of income is strong, both across the equity, the credit and the specialist assets. Buckets. Defensive assets, again, it should be assets that are less correlated to the other buckets. It should provide defensive qualities uh, and we should implement that more fully at times when we think there's, there's times of market stress that are, are approaching. The trust also has a discount control mechanism. So it's a, it's a, it's a small trust, so this is important. The discount control mechanism ensures that the share price trades close to the now. It was implemented in 2016. So the beginning of the chart, I think, just shows the end of the, the pre-discount control mechanism period. And you can see from the, the time when it was implemented, you can see the range, how tight that the share price has traded around the, the now. Now it's also important for liquidity as well because the discount control mechanism is always there, making sure that the share price stays close to the now. So it's always there to provide liquidity if somebody wishes to sell in the, in the, in the market. Now I mentioned before uh, the diversity of, of income. So this is something that's important to us. So if, 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 if I kind of generalize the chart at the top, the, the income is split kind of in, in, in three ways. So specialist assets has usually contributed around a third historically. UK equities has, has contributed around a third. And then the other third has been between overseas equities and credit. And that relationship has remained fairly stable for the majority of the cycle. Then COVID hit and equities, the majority of equities either cut or suspended the dividend. Uh, lots of income funds pay much lower dividends over, over 2020. The trust maintained its dividend. A big, a big part of maintaining that dividend was that specialist assets stepped up to the plate. The majority of our trust during 2020 maintain the dividend and even a lot of them even raised the dividend during the peak of the COVID crisis. So during COVID, the specialist assets went up to about a half of the contribution of, of the income, helping to support the income during times of stress. Now, as you can see, that, that relationship starting to normalize again now where UK equities contribution is starting to increase and specialist assets will start to decrease. Now, it will probably go back to that one third, one third, one third uh, relationship again for, the, for the, the remainder of the cycle. The bottom part is our objective to raise the dividend above inflation. So we're looking at the, the CPI index. So as you can see, we've, we've, we've maintained that. We've maintained the dividend. We've raised it above inflation. As you can also see, the recent spike in inflation has meant that relationship, is, that, those two lines are getting a little bit close together. For the next year, we're projecting that we will cover the dividend from, from underlying investments. But as you can see, there'll be, a, there'll be a decision to be made from the board soon on, on, on what to do with the dividend. And that chart will, will give you some indication on, on the, the, the discussions that will take place. So what I've done in this chart, we've looked at the UK equity income market. The trust has a, has a strong equity skew. It has a strong UK skew. So uh, kind of a reasonable place to compare the yield and the performances against the UK equity income market. Now, these are the top 10 funds by AUM on the, in the Morningstar universe. There's about 27, 28 billion in AUM across these 10 funds. Now, obviously a lot of them last year were paying much lower dividends because equity income was hit hard. Mavit has maintained the, the same dividend right the way through COVID. And it's actually the yield is, is, is the second best of it. So if the orange bar is the second best of those 10 funds. We're also, there's a lot more diversity in, in there as well. One of the common things about UK equity income is there's a lot of correlation between the, the contributors to income. There's a lot of small, you know, small number of FTSE 100 stocks uh, that, will, that will be major contributors to income in the UK, UK equity income space. We've got overseas income, we've got credits, and we've got specialist assets, all contributing to that income. So it's much more diverse. And we've got the closed-ended structure that helps enable the, the dividend as well over time. And we've also outperformed the majority of those funds over the long term as well. So we, we've beaten the all share over the past 10 years. And we've done that, the FTSE all share in the UK. 
And we've done that with around two thirds of the volatility as well. Uh, this is a chart that we saw. I was talking about our valuation focus from a bottom up perspective before, but also from our asset allocation, we don't see ourselves as, as trying to predict the future. So, you know, this is our view on inflation. This is our view on what the Fed is going to do, and this is how we'll shift the portfolio to accommodate that. Our asset allocation is also fed strongly from valuation. Now, what this chart is doing, it's looking, we look at the CAPE ratio, so the cyclically adjusted PE. So I'll apologize for people who already know what that is, but what, what, if you look at the earnings of, of companies and you average the earnings over 10 years, that gives you a cyclically adjusted PE. So that's the E in the, in the PE. Now, what we do is we take, this example is the UK equity universe. We take all the stocks in the universe. So let's say there's 3000 stocks. We will take all of them. We'll look at the 10 year average earnings over all of those stocks and we'll calculate cyclically adjusted PEs. Now, what we found is the relationship between the valuation you purchase at and the future returns is very strong. So it, it's common sense, it's buy low, sell high. So if you look at, to give an example, 2002, the percentage of that universe with CAPE ratios that were low, so between five and 10 times was at a peak. And then look at the color, look at the, the, the gray line, which is the future returns, the next five years returns. That has been the five years returns also at the peak. So again, when, when, a, when a market is trading low in terms of you're buying those cash flows, those average cash flows for a lower valuation, common sense says your future return will be higher. And that relationship holds very true, as you can see from this chart. So we are more influenced by valuation in our assets allocation uh, than, than, than kind of a macro view or momentum or what everyone else, what the herd is doing. Okay, so our, responsible, our commitment to responsible investing. So throughout my career, I've seen ESG change and there's lots of different ways to, to perceive it and implement it. You can just exclude a number of stocks, or you can have impact investing, which means that every investment will have a positive impact on, 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 on the planet, on society, et cetera. We believe in engagement. Uh, so there's a lot more detail on this on our website, so I refer people to our website to look at our, our policies, et cetera. But we believe in engaging with our companies, speaking to them and, and, and helping them to improve. And there's some examples later on in the presentation, which I'll, I'll help provide some more color around this as well. But I'll, again, I will also refer you to the website for, the, for more detail on our ESG policy. Now, Lucy mentioned earlier about uh, our size, our lower AUM has enabled us to fish in parts of the market that maybe our larger peers uh, can't get access to. And that's the specialist assets market is, is, is one that's, that's uh, a good example of that. So I'll, I'll give some examples of some of the investments in the portfolio. So the first one is probably one at first we invested in this in the IPO in 2018. Not many people had heard, heard of it. We were there at the very beginning when we were trying to raise capital. We did our due diligence. We, we researched the manager, we researched the proposition, we researched the market, and we found this was a compelling investment. It's a lot more kind of mainstream now, so the asset class has matured over the past three years. Uh, why did we invest in it? So the let's talk about the market, so the, the, the music royalties market. The, music, the global spend on music was declining from 2000 to 2014. Why was that? Because people were downloading music illegally when they got the internet at home. And that was because there was no viable, reasonably priced alternative. You could either go out and buy one album, a CD for 10, 15 pounds, or you could download any music you wanted for free. And the public chose the, the, the illegal option. And that ravaged earnings in the music industry for 15 years almost. Then streaming emerged, a reasonably priced alternative that was legal. For 10 pounds a month, you could have access to the, you know, the whole back catalogue of, of most major record labels. So from 2014 onwards, the music industry started to grow. The global spend started to grow from a record low, uh, and it's grown significantly since then. And year upon year, there's been, there's been no break to that growth. So we've got a, a growth story now, so that we're, we're already attracted to, to, the, to the overall market. Also within that, Hypnosis was buying the songwriter catalogs. Now, the songwriter is, strangely, I, we feel is the most important part of creating a, a song, but they've actually received the smallest share of royalty. So for every dollar of royalty, it's split between the record label, the artist, the songwriter, and now in modern times, the digital platforms such as Spotify. And, this, and the, the songwriter is the smallest portion of that. There's a lot of legal challenges at the moment to, to change that and make, this, make the, uh, the, the songwriter more important and get a bigger, bigger share of that, that pie, that growing pie. And we fully believe in that. Historically, when you produce CDs, you have to fund them, manufacture them, distribute them around the world. The record label was very important in that process because they, they funded and organized all that. Now with the digital delivery, 
there's not so much a, the level of importance of the record label is not, is not as high. So there's lots of challenges now for the songwriters to get a bigger share of the pie. And again, that would enhance our returns as owners of the of, of music royalties. This is a, 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 a trust that's managed by music insiders. So a lot of a lot of uh, very experienced music insiders are managing the trust. Um, we think it's a, an excellent diversification from the rest of our the rest of our, our holdings, you know, typical equity, credits, etc. It's an asset class that's mature, and the discount rates used to value these assets is coming down. Um, we've probably since IPO, I think we've had ten percent to twelve percent per annum returns with between income and capital growth. And a lot of the changes that we're expecting to happen and the disruption that's going on in the industry and the growth, we expect that to continue as well. So we're going to be long-term holders of, of, of this asset class and this, this particular trust. Next is Gore Street Energy Fund. So if you think about renewables and the government's objectives to uh, be have zero, zero emissions by 2050, that's going to be mainly done by, uh, I think we also want to be the leader in, in, in wind power. Now, that's great, but how do you implement it? because coal and nuclear are very predictable in terms of how much power you can produce. Solar, wind is very unpredictable and there's spikes, and, you know, there'll be days when there's not much sun, there'll be days when there's not much wind. But the national grid doesn't, doesn't accommodate for that. You have spikes in demand and, and so you need to match that demand and supply. So now if you're moving to more uh, cleaner such as energy supplies such as wind and solar, how do we manage that mismatch between supply and demand? And this is where Gold Street sits in battery farms so essentially they sit plugged into the grid and they're just, they're just large lithium ion batteries and they can make money in a number of ways. So you can, you can trade energy, you can buy energy when it's cheap, store it in your batteries and then sell it back to the grid when, when, when demand is high and prices are high. You can, you can rent those batteries to the grid and you can just balance that supply so to keep recharging the, 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 the grid when, when, when it's needed. Or you can, you can uh, store it so you, you can, you can generate energy or take energy from the grid when, when, when prices are low, store it in the back and then, and then disperse it again, discharge those batteries uh, again when prices and demand is high. Uh, so again, for us, this has got great ESG credentials, it's benefiting society, and we get a, it's got a target 7% yield while we sit and wait for these changes to, to be implemented, and a total return target of 10%. Next is, is Homemeet, which I think IPO'd last year. Again, another one with great ESG credentials. So if you think about homelessness in society, uh, local authorities spend a lot of money battling homelessness. There's limited supply of properties. Uh, so what they've had to do over the past few years is rely on temporary accommodation a lot more. Now that's such as B&Bs and hotels. And I think over the past, in 2018, 19, over a billion pounds was spent on, on temporary accommodation. So it's a big problem for, for local authorities. What they need is access to, to more access to properties. So where, this is where Home Meet steps in. It's buying a large large banks of properties across the country. It's then going to to sign uh, to agree leases with housing associations that are ultimately backed up by local authorities. That are ultimately backed up by housing benefit. That's ultimately backed up by the government. They're going to sign twenty to twenty five year leases, full insure and repair leases. So it's the housing association that has the infrastructure to to maintain the properties. Uh, and they're going to do that with a decent yield. So the investor gets a, a reasonable yield. The targeted dividend yield is five and a half percent. The leases are very long. They have inflation protection in, in the year. So there's, there's annual reviews depending on inflation. And then your ultimate client is, is essentially the government. So you've got a really strong uh, uh, customer in, 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 the, in, in the leases. So strong sustainable income and a, and a really reliable uh, uh, Reliable uh, tenants are the, the word I'm up for. Uh, digital nine infrastructure. So we've been heavily invested in, in the renewable space. So we've always been invested in infrastructure. We were quite early in a lot of the renewables trusts. We've had strong returns from those. We think there's a there's a kind of a next level now of, of, of infrastructure. Um, we own two. We own digi digital nine infrastructure and we own Cordians. Now, what is digital infrastructure? It's essentially the plumbing for the internet. So what type of assets does that entail? It entails the, the subsea cables that go between the US, the UK and Ireland and around the world that deliver bandwidth. Uh, they're rented to, 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 to place people like Facebook, Amazon, et cetera. It's data centers. So with the cloud storage where your photos are stored online, et cetera, is these huge data centers packed full of computers that have all that, 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 that storage space. 
And then there's mobile towers. So when you, you, your telephone, your mobile telephone is, is transmitting data, it's going through regional uh, mobile towers. So they're the, the different types of assets that digital, digital man and Cordian will, will target. Uh, the demand for data is going up and up every year, and nobody can argue that that's not going to change. You know, as we, everything becomes more digitized, the digital delivery of, of you know, we, we talked about music early on, TV, et cetera, and just mobile phone uh, use, data usage is, 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 is growing significantly. So the infrastructure to support that is incredibly important. The trust is targeting a 6% dividend yield per annum. It's already, that dividend has already been compressed a bit because the share price has grown since IPO and it's targeting a 10% total return per annum. So it, again, the, the subsea cables, if you think about the security of the income, the subsea cables are rented to Facebook, Amazon, Instagram, those type of companies, huge financially strong companies that are in long-term leases. So that the, the income is strong, predictable and backed up. And then it, with the mobile phone towers, et cetera, that's you know, the, the big uh, cable, uh, the big telephone companies. So again, secure underlying clients and strong stable income is exactly what we want. Uh, and, and diversity as well. It's, it's very diverse from, from other investments in the portfolio. Uh, so let's go through our performance. So in the multi-asset space, we're a lot more equity orientated than some of the more kind of uber defensives in, in, in the space. We have a, a, a UK SKU. Now this, on, on, this, on this chart, we've got our benchmark, we've got the FTSE All Share, the FTSE UK Private Investor Balanced, and the MSCI UK All Cap. So over the long term, we, we've come out on top. Uh, over 10 years, if you look at the trust, it's just over 9% annualized return. That's roughly split 50-50 between income and capital growth. We've grown the income as we, as we, we plan to do ahead of inflation. So we've met the objectives over the, over the long term. We are long-term investors. Over the short term, there will be some variability. But over the long term, that's what we, tar we want to hit our target over the long term. And we have done over the past five, three, five, and 10 years. The next slide just shows the, the, the performance over those periods of so three months, six months, one year, three and five. And again, the NAV and the share price have beaten, our bench have beaten the benchmark over each one of those periods. And we've maintained the dividend ahead of inflation. I'll hand over to Lucy to talk through some of the the platform availability. Thanks, Gary. Um, and thank you very, everybody for your time and interest this evening. Hopefully, whether you're existing investor or not, it provides us an extra layer of insight on how we see the world and perhaps how we can support diversification um, amongst a wider portfolio. If you did like what you see, we are available on all the major platforms that are listed here. So I'll leave those on for a couple of moments just for you to have a little glance over. Um, but as I said in my opening remarks, I'm the relationship manager for the trust. So anything you need, um, please feel welcome to get in touch with me anytime. Always here to help. Thank you. Oh, thanks very much, uh, Lucy and Gary. And um, uh, I think we've had a few questions through already. So uh, I think at this stage, we'll, we'll, we'll go through to the questions. I've got a few others here as well. Um, so one from Neil here, your portfolio is well diversified across asset classes and seems well balanced. However, there, there have been two episodes where the market has induced a significant drawdown in the trust value, the, the great financial crisis and the, the pandemic. Uh, why should your portfolio have been marked down so heavily by the market given its, uh, its balance? And, and what steps have you made to mitigate any future drawdown magnitudes? Yeah, uh, so great question. So if you use COVID uh, last year as a nice uh, recent example. Uh, so if you look at the portfolio of the structure, so 35% UK equities and their mid-cap value equities. The specialist assets is around 25% of the portfolio. Uh, and then there's overseas equities. So you're talking probably 80% plus is in equity and specialist assets. And then the final 15% in credit. So during, during a more benign environment, those specialist assets kind of act like low beta equities. They generate a decent income. They're not very volatile. But then at, at times of extreme stress, they can detach from the, the NAVs. So, so one, the NAVs can be hurt. And then secondly, the, the share price can detach significantly. So there's numerous examples. So even hypnosis, the music royalties, the actual cash flows have remained reasonably uh, round hill and out of the day. And they, their, their COVID, uh, one of our music royalties funds, their COVID earnings have been exactly the same through COVID to the, to the pre-COVID era. But hypnosis detached the share price was down about, I think, 20% at one point for those 
few weeks at the end of March. So our equity exposure, UK mid-cap value, uh, UK was the worst hit in the initial COVID period as well. So there was already the Brexit uh, drama going on in the background of the Brexit negotiations. So the UK was already trading at a discount. Then uh, the UK traded at a further discount because the initial COVID response was so poor in the UK. So our equity kind of underperformed global equity. Our specialist assets then detached from, from, from the NAV significantly for a very short period of time. It, re it, 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 it reversed quite quickly, but for the short period of time it did. Uh, so that's probably the, the, and value as well. So if you think about the dynamics of value and growth, we're value managers. So value is, and, and income is probably more biased towards consumer discretionary, industrials, more cyclical type of, 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 of markets. Growth would be more kind of technology and healthcare. So at the bottom of the market, all those people wanted to buy was US uh, treasuries, maybe some technology and healthcare. We don't have exposure to any of that. Uh, so yes, a time to extreme crisis, there'll be a little bit more volatility in our portfolio than others. But what we can demonstrate is over the full cycle, we, we, we deliver stronger returns. So yes, you do have to accept a little bit more volatility, but we've, we, you've been rewarded for that as an investor with stronger returns over the long term. What have we done to, 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 to soften that going forward? So defensive assets is one of the components that we, we, we've introduced that going forward when we see markets are richly valued. So we're never going to kind of second guess the market and predict the next crisis and what it is, et cetera. But we'll have the tools to be able to, you know, gold, uh, sovereign, uh, sovereign uh, short ETFs. There's a lot of different levers we can pull there that when we see markets becoming richly valued, we can tilt away from the more kind of cyclical and, and higher beta exposures to defensive assets. So that's the action we've taken for future kind of uh, market drawdowns. So hopefully that, that's... Thank you. Um, just, uh, you mentioned earlier that um, you your target is to achieve something like a 6% uh, premium over CPI over the cycle. Can you tell us what you've achieved over the past 10 years, looking back, have you, have you managed to get hit that 6% target? Yes, we have. So the, the benchmark changed slightly and became a little bit more aggressive, I think, uh, a few years before I joined, which might have been 2015, 2016. But yeah, so I think I mentioned it, I think the figure is just over 9% is what we've delivered over 10 years. If you think about CPI, give, you know, excluding the past few, the past six months a year, CPI has trended around 2%. So we've delivered that right. benchmark, we have delivered on it. So this year, it'll be, this year the benchmark will be more aggressive because CPI is so high. But yes, we have delivered on it. But uh, that benchmark was implemented in 2015, 2016. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, well, question here about your size, and, and Lucy referred to it at the, at the, at the, uh, at the beginning there, that um, it's, it's useful to be a relatively small trust and be nimble of foot, and it allows you to invest in things that larger trusts wouldn't be able to. Um, but in an ideal world, then, what would your optimum size be? I guess there's a, a limit to how big you want to get, is there? Yeah, so obviously the trust is running parallel, but we have some weeks as well. So there's not kind of one figure just for the just for the trust. But I think the strategy as a whole can accommodate well over a billion in terms of AUM and be comfortable and still, still have the same kind of uh, diversification that we've got, still go down the market cap spectrum to where we are now and to invest in all of it and to fully invest into the investment trust space. So probably maybe a, a figure of around one and a half billion is probably something I'd have in mind now. Obviously things change over time, liquidity will move around in markets, but I think as a rough figure of, of, of an ARM would be about one and a half billion across the, the strategy rather than the, the product. Right, right. So, um, okay. So you, you, it would be that kind of level that you'd start to think about yeah, sort of alternative strategies. Okay, um, and, and in terms of your dividend, have you ever actually reduced the dividend in the last sort of 10 years or so? Yes, uh, way before my time. So I don't know I, I, the dates, I don't know, but I think probably 10 years, maybe 10 years plus we, we did, maybe after the great financial crisis, after the 2008 crisis. But over the past five, six, seven years, no, the dividend has just, has just uh, grown over the past few years. Okay, and um, discount management policy, uh, uh, what's the what are the kind of limits between which you intend to operate? I notice at the moment, for example, I think you've got about forty percent of shares held in Treasury, or it's quite a large chunk. Yeah, so 
kind of, because of the kind of COVID crisis, there's been a lot of sellers in the market. So the, the multi-asset trusts haven't been kind of growing and there's been a, a, a scarcity of buyers over the recent months. So mm -hmm. again, this discount control mechanism has, has fully operated during that period. And that's why the treasury, uh, the number of shares in treasury is high. It's because we've backed up what we've said. We've implemented the discount control mechanism. And when people have wanted to sell, the trust has bought the, the shares back. So you can see the performance over the past year and the recovery phase from the, the trust. And we fully expect the, that, that that dynamic will change and it's, it's starting to change already. So hopefully we'll go back to a, a shared issuance phase from, from this point forward. Have you have you actually got any firepower left to keep on buying at this stage? Yes, yes. So there's, there's the, the, the board, I, can't, I don't know what the exact figures are, but the board have got a, a, a mandate which goes through, it gets approved in the... In the AGM, of, I think it's up to a certain percentage of the of the trust, and that can just be renewed. So, the, and the board have done that only numerous times before. So, the board are fully back on the discount control mechanism, and it's been the ultimate test over the past year. Uh, it's been the ultimate test of the discount control mechanism, and it's worked, and it's been implemented, and it's been maintained. Right, and you've got the cash on the balance sheet to to continue to buy at this stage, have you? Yes, and there's, there's perfectly liquid assets in there that we could redeem if we needed to as well. So there's not a problem there. Uh, but also the, the, the buybacks have also started to fade in recent months as well. So you yeah. can see kind of a peak up just after the COVID crisis. And I think the performance since the COVID crisis as well, we're back on our usual trajectory. So I think that the, 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 the crisis is behind us now in terms of the COVID and market shutdowns, et cetera. So now this is a market that's very accommodative to us. If you think about the market last year, it was, it was the, the worst spread between value and growth. The UK was the worst performing market. That has actually reversed now. And the UK is actually ahead of the game and ahead of the rest of the world in terms of its, its, its vaccination programme. It's opening up quicker. Value is now, you know, last year, nobody wanted to own value. It was, it was probably one of the key problems everybody wanted to own. Technology, healthcare, growth, quality growth, high growth. Inflation is coming, which is more supportive of, 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 of you know, it's more harmful to growth stocks than value stocks. So, that environment that was probably the worst possible environment we could have had last year has now yeah. fully reversed. So I think we're now in a massively different environment and a massively different dynamic now. I think, okay. it's, sorry, I think it's also worth just adding that the trust has a really strong and stable institutional shareholder base as well and um, that we've had over the long term. Okay, thanks, Lucy. Um, you, you, you say, uh, obviously, you'd, you'd like to increase the dividend in line with inflation. If inflation, as we we hear it now, is is going to be taking off in in the next year or two, um, will you have to? Do, or does it look like at the moment you'd have to sell capital assets to cover the dividend? No. So the closed ended structure of the uh, of the trust allows us some flexibility. So there's a a, a, a large amount of distributable reserves in the trust. That we can utilize at times of stress such as that. So if inflation does go increase significantly, uh, then we don't want the portfolio to have to chase income, etc. So there'll be a decision. It's the board's decision, it's not the investment manager's decision. So the board will take that decision. But there's a lot of levers that can be pulled there. So there's a lot of dis distributable reserves that can tide the trust over, maintain the dividend, maintain stability, and they can be called upon if needed. But again, I must stress it's the board's decision rather than the investment decision, or the investment manager's decision. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Um, just one here that came in pre-submitted. What's the, just bear with me? What's the reasoning behind your strategic asset allocation targets, and um, under what circumstances would you consider a change in those targets, if if at all? And yeah. would you be able to change them radically without shareholder approval? Uh, so there's a, there's a number of ranges in the in the uh, legal paperwork for the trust. So there's, there's ranges that we can operate in, but the strategic asset allocation, yes, it should remain stable. How do we decide it? We look at long-term returns. In some cases, it's 100 years plus of markets. We look at the long-term returns of those markets. So for, for the to be significant change, it would have to be a very dramatic uh, structural change in, in, in the world. So for there to be a huge change, I, I very much doubt it. We review them every year around the middle of the year, around June time. And there may just be slight moves that would, would probably would be the, 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 the more predictable uh, changes that would be dramatic changes. I, I, I would definitely definitely say uh, now we'd have to be in a very different world for there to be dramatic changes to the SAA. You, did you ever look at a dramatic change when COVID hit? Or no, so COVID, so COVID, COVID is, was always going to be, uh, it was never going to be a kind of a long term, uh, sorry, the lights are going in the, in the 
it was never going to be a long-term change. So COVID was a short term. So if you think about it, if you look at 100 years' worth of returns, even though there were significant drawdowns in one year due to COVID, then uh, it doesn't affect 100 years' worth of, of, of returns massively anyway. Uh, so yeah, the SAA is strong, is, is stable. It's reviewed every year, but it, it's, it's very stable. And I wouldn't expect too much change whatsoever in the future. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> um, apart from value metrics, uh, which you've mentioned, uh, what other metrics do, would you then consider as important when selecting an investment for the portfolio? Yeah, so we've, we've highlighted our valuation uh, kind of focus, but then what you're trying to get is, is, is as much quality as you can for the, an attractive valuation. So if I give you some examples, Let, let's say Lyrical, our US equity manager, they buy stocks in the cheapest quintile of the US market. So the US market is the most richly valued market in the world at the moment. So a lot of people would say it's overvalued, it's expensive, but it's distorted by a small number of tech stocks. Lyrical buy the cheapest quintile, so that's their, that's their pool where they fish the cheapest quintile stocks. So the risk is there, then you've got stocks that are on the way to be to, to kind of uh, to, to disappear, where earnings have fallen, they're structurally impaired, etc. But their portfolio has earnings growth that's stronger than the S&P. So they're looking at stocks that are in the cheapest quintile, but with earnings growth stronger than the market. And they've maintained that. They've all, they've, throughout the, the, the life of the fund, which has gone from 2008, the earnings growth has been either the same or higher than, than the market. And actually, at the moment, it, the earnings growth is the highest that it's ever been in the history of the fund. So yes, we're, we're focused on valuation, but we want bang for our book in terms of quality. So that's one example. Another example is we use Marat Right Fuji Yield in Japan as our as Japanese manager. That's trading on a price to book of about 0.7. So we dismantled the companies now that the, the trade on less what the, the, the sum of the parts are. So there's the, there's the valuation uh, rationale. But then on the, on, the, on the kind of quality side, most of the, the, the portfolio is something like 60% net cash. So cash and securities on the balance sheet. So a lot of these are, are kind, of, kind of slow, bored and stable, uh, well-capitalized companies, but trading on significantly low valuations. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's any more examples. So yeah, probably Moran Wright and, 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 and Lyrical are probably the, the best examples of say where you get bang for your buck. If you fish outside of the main, you know, the top funds and the top the, the index stocks, you can find decent quality and high quality stocks trading at really attractive valuations. And that's what we're looking for. Okay, thank you. Um, question here, how do you compare with BMO? I'm thinking that's one of the similar looking trust, if I recall, in the multi-asset area, isn't it? Yeah, I think, uh, so BMO, I think, I think the majority of that is mainly investment trusts. Uh, so I'll, I wouldn't like to comment too much on, on their fund, but I think it's main, I think it's hundred percent investment trusts in BMO. So I may, I may be wrong on that. Um, All right, okay. I don't have to know which which fund they're referring to. So I, I think there's the, in the in the flexible space, there's a couple of BMO trusts, and I think they mainly invest in other trusts. So our specialist assets would be a similar representative of what BMO is, what if, if it's the same trust that I'm thinking about. Whereas we've got OICs and direct equities in there as well, which would be kind of the differential between us and BMO. But I'm guessing they're what trust they're referring to. There. Oh, all right. Okay. Okay. And um, could you provide more detail about your investment pr process? I think you, well, you've actually just done some of that already by talking about other things rather than just the uh, the value based assessments. Um, is is um, I don't know if there's anything more you could share with us at this stage. I think there's probably there's two elements. So on the specialist financials, we've been investing in that space for for, for almost twenty years. So yeah. any, any new IPOs that come to market, a lot of the time we do the test market for the brokers. So we've got good relationships with the brokers. Any new trust coming to market, we will know about them beforehand. We'll do our due diligence and we could be in there early. So we're not afraid to go in early in any asset classes. So we, we've got experience in the space. Uh, on the fund side, we've got a lot of fund selectors. We know the market. We're looking for managers that are outside of the kind of traditional universe where the, all, the hot AUM goes. Uh, and we've got very experienced people that, that have done that for a long for a long time. So our portfolio, you should see a lot of names that you you, you don't see elsewhere. And that's probably a significant part of our process. The other thing is we've got specialists, research specialists in every area, and they they want to understand that market. They want to come forward with ideas, but then when we do bring an idea forward, it has to get past the rest of the team. And we have what we call a competition for capital. If something's in the portfolio 
whoever's the research specialist can easily fall in love with it and have a blink of view. The rest of the portfolio managers and the rest of the team are challenging anything in the portfolio. If the investment thesis is starting to decline, there's another idea in another part of the portfolio that's pushing and fighting to get into that portfolio. So that competition for capital hopefully means the, the, the weaker elements of the portfolio are removed, bringing in new, stronger ideas constantly, and that's a constant, a constant flow. So they're probably kind of ways where I think we're slightly different from other people, but obviously the rest of the process I've highlighted earlier in the presentation. Right, thank you. Um, the um, Just a, a question following on from that kind of BMO discussion we had uh, on a wider basis, which funds, I guess, or trusts, do you consider to be your closest competitors and what would set you apart from, from those? Yeah, so the flexible space is, is very, there's a lot of very different uh, trusts in there. So you have the Uber defensives that are kind of, you know, four to 6% low volatile returns. That's one part of the market. Uh, I think there's not many that operate a hybrid approach like we do, where we're trying to find the best of breed managers in some asset classes and direct investments in one. The ones that probably might match us closely would be something like JP Morgan, which is mate would be the Bloomberg ticker. Uh, that they're probably they're multi asset, but I think they're more direct investment where the whole portfolio will all be directly invested. So it'll all be JP Morgan uh, manages direct investments. So I don't think there's anyone that matches us. And then you have the, the BMOs and the uh, Premier Mitons, which is MIGO, M I G O is the ticker for that one. They're more 100% trusts. So right. I would say we sit in the middle of, of those two ends of the spectrum. There's 100% trust on one end, the Uber defensives on the other. And then in the middle is kind of like us, JP Morgan, uh, there might be one or two others. They, that's probably where we sit in it. But we're obviously on the more kind of a equity orientated side, so we're on the more aggressive side than the Uber defensives is, is where I would position us. But the, as I say, there's no one that kind of does exactly the same as what we do. Not that I know the way we're learning. Okay, thank you. Um... Well, it seems like we're all out of questions at the moment. Uh, I'll just leave it open for a minute and see if anybody comes in with a last, a last gasp question. Um, but um, excellent uh, presentation. So thank you very much for that, Gary and Lucy. And, um, uh, you know, uh, I think it's uh, be interesting the next year <laughs> with the inflation <laughs> stoking up and all sorts of wonderful things happening in the market at the moment with shortages and and uh, China on the agenda and COP26 just around the corner. Uh, it's going to be exciting, if nothing else. So um, uh, I wish you well with your, your strategy and um, hope that we can perhaps get you back in a year's time to update us on how it's going. Yeah, That'd sure. be wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in.